Sagen Sie jetzt mal bitte A. Anarchie. 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 Ob geschichtlich oder brandaktuell. Mit Berichten und Interviews, mit Beiträgen und Collagen. Beleuchtet das anarchistische Radio Berlin das Phänomen des Anarchismus. Viva Anarchie! Climate change, economic crisis, unrest from Sarajevo to Baltimore, and now the looming threat of war. The prevailing order is unsustainable in every way. Today, even the entrenched representatives of the status quo admit that it is necessary to change everything. But the best they can come up with is to appeal to the same authorities and values that caused these problems in the first place. What would it mean to change everything? In this presentation, anarchists from across the world discuss the struggles that are unfolding around the world and describe the anarchist alternative to a life of servitude and strife. This tour is part of a worldwide initiative by the Crime Think Collective, supporting a free multimedia introduction to anarchism in 20 languages. As Anarchist Radio Berlin, we recorded this presentation at the Eastern European tour of To Change Everything at the Anarchist Book Fair in Prague, Czech Republic. After screening the campaign video, the presentation of the two comrades began, followed by an interesting discussion. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, why we think it is more, more realistic to change everything than it would be to, uh, to fix society one little piece at a time. Two weeks ago in Baltimore in the United States, there was a protest because the police had killed someone. To, uh, put up your hand if you've heard of this. Okay, right, right? Yeah. And first there was a, a legal law-abiding protest where people said, oh, if only the police would be good, you know, why, why do they do these bad things, you know? Could they maybe behave a little bit better? We've had demonstrations like this in the United States for decades and nothing happens. After that demonstration, the legal demonstration was over, uh, people marched, an unpermitted march, an unplanned march. And they, you know, they got downtown and they attacked the police, smashed the police cars, smashed up the stores, you know, made a mess of the city, right? And this, uh, this got out of control very quickly. And these are not people who are doing this because they read Kropotkin or Bakunin, you know, but because it's, it's become clear that that there isn't another way to, uh, to, to respond to a system that is killing them now. Four days ago, I was in the airport uh, waiting to come to, to Europe. And of course, I'm, I'm dressed nice because sometimes I've had some trouble flying with the uh, FBI. And I'm, you know, my, my bags are full of nothing but anarchist literature. Um, <laughs> I guess dreadlocks didn't help as well. I have them tied back, you know, I look like a, like a law-abiding hippie. Um, but I, I'm sitting, waiting for the airplane, and I'm hurrying to write, write the account from my friends in Baltimore, you know, so I can send it and then get on the airplane. And I, but I'm distracted because the person sitting next to me waiting for the airplane is watching their phone, and on their phone is just people fighting police. For, for minutes, you know, it's like a normal dressed person, you know, he doesn't look like a punk. And uh, I, I keep looking over and the, it says police on the back of their jackets in English, you know, and the, the police are actually having a bad time of it in, on the phone. Um, and, and finally, I'm like, what if this is Baltimore and it's in, you know, it's happening again and the thing that I'm writing is, is going to be uh, out of date. So finally, I, even though I'm trying to pretend that I'm not an anarchist, I say to the person next to me, is that, is that Baltimore? And he says, no, it's Macedonia. And I say, Macedonia? And the, the, but the people are chanting, no justice, no peace. And he's like, yeah, in Macedonia. Uh, and I'm like, is it in, in Skopje? And he, he says, no one in the United States has ever asked me about Skopje. They didn't know that, that Skopje exists. They think Macedonia is in uh, you know, Asia or something. But, you know, um, we have a conversation about this. And he says that in Macedonia there's a conflict between the, uh, the parties, the party in power, the opposition party. Um, 
but that this has erupted onto some kind of some kind of street confrontation that's taking place that night. And he says he himself is uh, Albanian, so he's he's hoping that it won't become an ethnic conflict, you know. But right now it seems like people fighting against the the party in power. And I, I finally, after we had this conversation, I, you know, he's like, how do you know about Macedonia and all these things? And I say, well, um, okay, I'm into radical politics. Um, that's, that's the, you know, why I'm like, I'm in contact with people in Macedonia or something. Um, here, I'm, I'm going to, to Europe to talk about this, this, this thing, you know, have, a, have one, you know. And he opens it up and he says, uh, and he's looking through it, expecting not to agree with it, you know. But he sees, you know, he's like, the problem is borders. He says, this is true, actually. You know, I came to the U.S. Uh, ten years ago with no papers, and I've been I've been working in a in a factory. You know, um, and he's he's looking through it, and actually he he agrees with everything he sees, and we have a conversation about it. And then we we get on different airplanes. In this interaction, is everything that I want to talk about tonight. First, that we're in a time of. Uh, of global unrest, where there are these explosions happening in, in different parts of the world. Second, that many of them are about the police, actually. I, I want to talk about that later, why the police are the, are the focus of so much rage. Um, also, the, the possibility that these uprisings could become nationalist or ethnic violence, or they could become uprisings against class oppression. And, and finally, you know, the fact that there is all of this sympathy from people that we would never have been able to talk with about revolution before. But that it's totally unpredictable when it happens, when these moments of revolt happen. Um, we were in Macedonia in September, speaking with comrades there, before the student strike in Macedonia, before the riots this week in Macedonia. And, uh, and people there said, uh, you know, we see what's happening in Romania, in Bosnia, in Ukraine, you know, in, in Greece, in Spain, but that will never happen in Macedonia. Macedonia is so quiet, so small. Nothing ever happens in Macedonia. And on that note, uh, I'm from Slovenia, which is the Balkan country that's not Slovakia, obviously. Um, <laughs> And anyway, uh, the funny thing is that just like the Macedonian friends, um, two weeks before the biggest uprising of our lives probably happened in Slovenia, we were like absolutely certain that nothing like that could ever happen there. Um, but guess what? It did. So the funny thing was that um, despite the fact that people in, in the second largest city of Slovenia, Maribor, were for decades living like in poverty, you know, they were losing their apartments, they had no jobs, no, no food even. And uh, in the end, it, wasn't, it was none of those things that got them on the street, but it was when the corrupted mayor installed a bunch of radars uh, measuring the speed of the cars. I mean, just one week, a lot of people really got a lot of tickets uh, from these radar machines. And all of a sudden, you know, in, during some nights, um, destroying those radars became a very popular sport. And uh, during these insurrectionary actions, basically, um, the protests started to happen in Slovenia. And after the police violence, in those protests, um, the solidarity riots started to happen uh, all over the country and uh, the next six months uh, it was just basically going from one demonstration to another, from one revolt to another, um, you know, people were smashing things, were fighting cops, were, were, were destroying, uh, destroying buildings and so on and so forth. And um, despite the fact that just recently we felt, okay, you know, um, we have this authoritarian government, but of course, you know, it doesn't matter how much trouble we make on the streets, this government will never fall. But guess what? It did, and only after two months of, of this kind of behavior on the streets. And um, to be honest, even though a lot of people were talking about, you know, how we need to change the system, how we need something different, how we need to get rid of all politicians, the truth was that uh, a lot of people were just satisfied when the government fell and the protests started to die out. But the, rea the reality was that none of the things that actually got people on the streets, corruption, um, you know, government in general, capitalism, poverty and so on, none of the demands to end those things were actually met, uh, even though the government fell. And anyway, 
going through that experience, we, we, you know, we were coming into contact with people that never hang out in our squads, that never come to our talks. Uh, these were people, you know, who we were fighting shoulder to shoulder with, and we realized that what we need to do there, uh, in that moment, is to, to kind of have, uh, to, to write down a set of ideas that inspire us, uh, basically to, to, to talk about the ideas that connect us. And this is why we joined the Crime Think uh, International Project to change everything that we are basically presenting here and the video that you saw is a part of it. Um, it's currently being translated into more than 20 languages, including Czech um, and Farsi and Arabic and Chinese and so we're just waiting for the translation from Malta, right? So, um, a lot of different uh, places. Basically, just starting a dialogue with different people having different experiences that can somehow connect with what, what we've just uh, been talking about. <coughs> so, to change everything. Why to change everything? Uh, I want to make the argument that today it would be more realistic to overthrow the entire system then it would be to, to fix it, to make it work the way it's supposed to. That it would be easier to, to have a revolution, you know, than it would be to, you know, to fix these problems one by one. I think it would be probably easier in the U.S. for me to overthrow the government than to be able to get the government to give me social welfare or something. This, uh, this relates to what you were saying, where you, you actually overthrew the government in Slovenia, but nothing changed. Like, like what has happened in Egypt, in Tunisia, for example. Why is this? I think in a, in a globalized capitalism where the investment money can go immediately from one country to another, as soon as there is any friction, uh, it means that the governments they have their backs against the wall the same way that we do. And it, it's a mistake to think that they're just mean, that they're just bad people, and if we can convince them to be nice, that then they can share everything with us. You know? I, think, I think this is a misunderstanding of the situation. The situation is not that the politicians are bad people. Fundamentally, the situ situation is that the structure is completely broken. You know? And that we are not going to uh, you know, have a protest and get them to change the laws and suddenly climate change will go away. You know? That we are not going to have a protest and they'll, they'll change the rules and suddenly the police will just create peace and harmony everywhere they go. Right? That we are not going to be able to, to make them fix the problems that we face. And that, and that maybe it is, it is actually a more, a more realistic plan to say that, that everything has to go. Um, and th this would explain why people who never thought of themselves as rebels are finding themselves in the streets fighting in intense ways. You know, and, and actually, all that is lacking from this is, is a strategy for, for how to make, for how to, how to make this, this change structural and systemic. This would, explain why, uh, this would explain the thing I was talking about earlier, about why all of these uprisings that are happening are uprisings against the police. You know? uh, people are having a hard time organizing unions or something. In, in, the, in the United States, unions are almost done. There's almost no unions because there's almost no steady jobs, right? Instead, the, you know, the only effective uh, use of union organizing is actually for people who don't have jobs. My friends in Bangladesh, uh, you know, they, they have a union organized, but it's the union for dead workers, the union for workers who were killed in the factory fires, in the collapsing factories, you know? This is, this is what we can do to defend our places as workers in the economy today. And when we are so vulnerable, when we are so precarious, the police become the most essential element in society because they're the only way to force us to continue participating in it. This is, this is the situation in which, in which we find ourselves. And, and I think, you know, in Baltimore and in Ferguson in the United States, in both of those cases, the police, in fact, were not enough. They had to bring in the military, the National Guard. This is, uh, this, is, this is the moment that we arrive at, where either we will transition into a more precarious and, and violent police society, a society in which order is imposed not by, uh, not by us being bought off with middle class status or something, but, but by us being forced into things. You know? 
or the, these uprisings that are, are taking place will convey us to another place. And speaking of these uprisings, despite the fact that they are often very radical in their method, um, that a lot of clashes and riots are happening, uh, what's also happening at the same time is the fact that um, a lot of people are demanding things. Um, you know, they are demanding more just police, um, no, no more racist police. They are demanding uh, more rights, um, demanding the end of austerity, uh, demanding the end of fascism, and so on. Um, and the problem is that this politics of demands is actually getting us away of changing everything. It's getting us towards this reformist politics. And the matter of fact is that what we want is nothing that anyone can give us. It's something that we have to take. Like, how, how can we ask the government to end sexism, for instance, if sexism is something that is also occurring in our everyday relationships? How, how can we, you know, are we any less governed, are we any less oppressed if there is a woman uh, being a president or, or a boss of a company? I guess not. So the problem is that with the politics of demands, we are constantly addressing the existing institutions. And by addressing ins existing institutions, we are giving them legitimacy. And at the same time, we are taking legitimacy away from us. We are addressing these institutions and turning them into the only agent that can bring change instead of basically building the strength amongst ourselves to create that change in our everyday life, in our struggles, um, where we work, where we live, where we study, where we revolt on the streets. When we are in the movement, um, you know, and this movement starts to happen, um, the first thing that, that, that's there, you know, is like uh, a huge pressure from the media, from the politicians, from everyone basically saying, who are you, who's your representative, and what do you want, what is your demand? And a lot, of, a lot of times people feel that they need to produce those demands fast, that if we have a movement that's just like going wild, being unpredictable, that this is not going to bring any change because it's just not going to be strong enough. Well, the matter of fact is that it is exactly the creation of those demands that is taking the strength away from the movement. The movements are not strong when, when we are predictable, when we go and negotiate, when we elect uh, or choose amongst ourselves representatives, even if those delegates are, you know, democratically or whatever elected. Um, when we try to, 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 to think about, okay, so what is it that we want, we realize that a lot of people want different things and the same people like myself, you know, during that uprising I wanted a million things and how could I even make a choice which one was the most important, which one comes first. And in a lot of uh, examples, like in Bosnia for instance, when one of the uprisings was also happening recently, they started to make those demands and what was happening is that they created a hierarchy of demands and that also created a hierarchy amongst people because there was always someone determining what's the most important thing. And all of those things are basically taking the power away from us and just putting them into <coughs> institutions, either those that we already have, like the state, political parties and so on, or those that we are creating. In Baltimore, the, uh, the media says, oh, what, what, what are they demanding? Well, they're demanding that the police be held responsible for the people they kill. But if you go into the streets, you know, the people, people will say, what are we demanding? Don't fuck with us, you know, which is a very different thing. Uh, I, I want to, I'll, I'll give another example. Um, this is from Brazil. Our comrades in Brazil who worked on uh, uh, Para Mudar Todo, the, the Portuguese version of To Change Everything, a few years ago they, they participated in another of these movements that became a giant uprising in the summer of 2013 in Brazil. Uh, and it began, you know, just as a protest against the, the cost of the public transportation was being increased by 20 cents. You know, and um, they, you know, so they were, they were saying, don't increase it by 20 cents. And first there were, you know, a few thousand of them protesting in the streets. Suddenly there were a million people in the streets fighting the police. And the government was like, oh, okay, we won't, we won't increase it. We, we grant your demand, you know. And, and then our comrades in Brazil were saying, see, everyone just needs to find their one demand, you know? You, if you demand 20 cents for, with the bus fare and demand something else with somebody else, you know? And, and that way you'll have these movements that are very strategic and very clear and you just move from one demand to the next, move from one change to the next. 
And, and what happened in Brazil, actually? Well, this year, the government increased the cost of public transportation by 50 cents. You know? And it turns out, actually, that Brazil just had a moment of prosperity when we had the recession in the United States and all of the, all of the money that was invested in the U.S. Was, was invested in Brazil, and the Brazilian market expanded. And so there was a year when the government could say, okay, okay, you're protesting, fine. Get, we won't charge you 20 cents. Okay. But as soon as that moment was over and the Brazilian government is in the same place now that the U.S. government is at, in, where they don't have very much money to work with, they can't compromise even if a million people are rioting. What happens in that situation? This is what I think is important to talk about now in, in Central Europe. After the, the protests in Brazil this year, after the government increased the, the cost of the, of the buses by 50 cents, the next thing that happened in Brazil was a giant right-wing protest movement with a million people in the street demanding that the military dictatorship come back. I think this is what happens when we anarchists convey to the public the idea that the government could do its work right if we would just press them enough. You know, we, you know, because then, then the situation is, oh, well, how do we get the government to do the right thing, you know? When, you know the left wing doesn't have an answer, actually. Look at Syriza, right? You know, they're like, we'd love to make every, you know, it, it possible to survive in Greece, but, you know, the, the global capitalist system actually won't let us, even though we promise to, you know? So who has a solution in this situation? Who has a solution for how to make capitalism sustainable? Who has a solution for, in a capitalist society, how to make it possible for governments to take care of the people? The people who are proposing a solution for this actually are the fascists. They're saying, if we just make the group of people who are included in the social safety net smaller, then we can preserve these social programs. I think that is what happens if we, if we give the idea that the governments can fix the problems. I think that, in fact, the only solution that will work is an international movement to abolish capitalism. It's not a coincidence that capitalism isn't making us all rich and comfortable, right? It's because the system itself is broken. And speaking of this international movement, um, one of the first steps that we all have to take when we find ourselves in this situation, and just a few examples that we spoke about, like tells you that perhaps right now you think that in Czech Republic this will never happen, but who knows what happens tomorrow, right? Um, the thing is that we have to know our strength, our own strength. And when we have it, we have to realize and act upon it. Like I talked briefly about Bosnia before. Um, there, uh, in, 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 this, uh, in the last spring, um, people, you know, who were like f ever since the, the end of the Balkan War, the last Balkan War, um, were divided by ethnic grounds. They came to the streets. They they basically said, "Okay, this is it. We have it with your corruption. We have it with your, you know, the poverty that you're imposing to us. We just have enough." And they went and they burned, you know, the headquarters of political <coughs> parties. They burned basically every municipality building in major cities all over Bosnia. They went and they burned down the governmental par the, the, the parliament because they have several, you know, because of these ethnic divisions and so on. And at that point, instead of, you know, thinking about, okay, so what, what's next, you know, to demonstrate our strength? Because, for instance, like some of the politicians in Mostar, you know, which is close to Croatian border, they were already running across the border at that point, you know, because they felt, okay, I guess this is it, you know, this is the time to go before it gets too, too bad. But what really happened was that at that point, um, people started to, to take a step back, to start to negotiate, to form demands for the government, the same government whose buildings they just you know, burned down. So sometimes you just have to know at which, which point of the struggle you basically are and what you can do from that point on, not to start addressing again the government as the actor, as the agent of the change, but thinking about you know, the change within, within us, among us. So, how do we strategize for these fights if we don't think we can, we can win a little victory? If what counts is not whether we win a specific battle, like, you know, then the important thing is the way that we fight and whether it demonstrates that we could change everything, that we could, that we could 
abolish capitalism, that we could overthrow government itself, not one government, but all of them, right? That we, that we could demonstrate this. And we may not win a single battle. The question is, from one battle to the next, how we build up a movement that is actually capable of, of changing the whole society. Um, please, let me look at my notes. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, OK. So in the United States, the insurrectionary anarchists, for, for years, we, you know, it seemed like we were in a time of social peace. We were like, if only we could have a, a confrontation of some kind. If only we could, we could have a, a fight. You know, if only somebody would fight the police, right? So we would fight the police by ourselves and, and lose, you know, usually. Um, and, and we were trying to, to create a situation in which other people would start to do this with us. Um, what we're seeing now is that those tactics have spread. They don't belong to insurrectionary anarchists. You know? Now we show up to riots with our hoodies, maybe with a piece of rock, and other people have guns. You know? Like A friend of mine was shot in, in Ferguson. He had a bullet in his heart. You know, it's, it's a much more intense thing than, than we are ready for. So we can see these tactics spread, right? But, the, uh, but just spreading the tactics isn't enough. If, if I talk about Ukraine here, will that fuck up what you're doing next? No, go on. Okay. Um, I think the danger is actually that if we, if we see our, our project as only to spread revolt, but without spreading the ideas along with it, then we will demonstrate ways to overthrow governments that will be just as useful to our enemies as they are to us. You know, I think that what we saw in Ukraine, it was just like Occupy in the United States, actually, where people feel, you know, they, they gather in the square and then they try to defend themselves against the police. But that, that tactic, that model was appropriated by, by statists and nationalists and was used for a, a sort of a state transformation rather than for liberation. I think if we take all of these risks to invent new tactics, new forms of struggle that can be taken from us by our enemies, that what we will see is that, is that the, the forms of struggle that, that we have, have created will be used against us, actually. In a, in a more and more precarious world, it's more important, you know, it's, it's becoming important for governments also to know how to act in the space of revolution, in the space of riots. So the, the, the challenge, I think, is for us to use, strat to use tactics that show what our strategy is and to use strategies that show what our goals are so that when we participate in these conflicts, it's not just that our tactics spread but that our values also spread. And this is, this is the reason that we have prioritized this, this project to try to communicate basic anarchist values with, with other people that we had not been in dialogue with before. Because we think that many people are, are going to be interested in this very soon. Well, you basically talked about how fragile our tactics are also to be co-opted by our enemy or, or, or by the state or whoever um, is basically not on our side. Um, I think it's not just the tactics that we use in, in moments of revolts, in, in, of bigger revolts. I think it's also um, the fact that our tactics are very fragile in moments um, of, of revolts of smaller scales. For instance, I, I come from, uh, like, we, we have a squad in Ljubljana that is there for 22 years, um, and we're really proud of it. It's, it's relatively big and stable and, and all of that, and, like, we put a lot of energy to maintain it. And yet, you know, like, uh, it is number two right after the Ljubljana Castle um, uh, tourist attraction in every Lonely Planet or every tourist guidebook that you can find. Um, like, you, you open the door and, like, if there are not at least 20 tourists, you know, taking a picture of you, you know, the native, um, like, that's a strange <laughs> name, right? Um, and the problem, the problem with that... Look, a Slovakian. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> the one, too. Um, and, and the problem with that is that, like, you, you become a little lazy in reinventing yourself as a squad, for instance, you know, or, like, you become, um, you, you just forget to reinvent uh, the tactic that you're using in, um, I don't know, like, guerrilla gardening or whatever, when, when it becomes such a popular tactic that every NGO is doing the same thing, you know, because, like, green gardening in the city is now a really big and important thing. So it's very important that we try to, to think about 
um, the fact that ha only building uh, you know tactics that are not confrontational um, or even if they are that if they become a repetition of itself it's just not getting us towards being more uncontrollable um, uh, harder to harder to basically uh, be co-opted and so on and there's also think about direct democracy for instance um, this is something like uh, an assembly as a form is something that we are always promoting more or less in our struggles like every time there's a student occupation what's the central thing that's happening of course the assembly every time that there is some kind of an uprising what we need to do like right after the right of course an assembly um, and in, in many of the cases this actually works and it's something positive um, but often we find ourselves in the dead end with it like that it's basically um, giving us uh, less problems with uh, acting autonomously than it is giving us the positive strength of connecting with other people. Like I remember that a few years ago in Ljubljana uh, we tried to occupy the, the whole faculty uh, uh, of arts and you know but uh, anarchists didn't really want to go against the popular consensus there so you know when people said oh but let's not occupy the whole faculty let's just occupy a few, uh, few rooms in the faculty you know, everyone was like, yeah, okay, let, let's just go with the, the consensus, right, and let's not destroy this. Um, and what <coughs> happened, of course, is the fact that no one even tried to evict those few rooms because, like, the, the process in the faculty was not even disrupted enough to mean anything. And all the things that people went into occupation for, like tuitions for PhD students, you know, not having autonomous space, none of those things were met because they were just not presenting any kind of, any kind of danger, basically. We learned something from, from that process, and uh, we, we, we knew that this, the biggest mistake of, of that experience was that we created an institution that we wanted to fight against. Let, let me expand this a little bit. You know, when, when the uprising was happening, we also had the assembly, we participated in those assemblies, but we took them as just a coordination moment, a place where we can meet, where we can discuss, but no decisions are done. In Bosnia, for instance, they went the other way around. And they, they created an assembly that became the only space of decision making. They, be, they basically created an institution that was to somehow replace the already existing structures that they, they were fighting against. And this is a problem when we uncritically employ the tactic that we generally feel is kind of ours and, and is actually, in many cases, I think, very positive. So. This is our, our brief argument for a, a revolutionary anarchism. Probably you are familiar with this idea already. Um, I, I just want to say again that we have been surprised in the United States by how quickly things have escalated. You know, um, The most radical thing that happened in Occupy in 2011 was that in Oakland, at the high point of the occupation, um, the people blocked the, uh, the highways and the port. Coming out of the, uh, the demonstrations in Ferguson, people blocked highways all around the country in dozens of cities. You know. Coming out of the, you know, coming out of, uh, coming out of that, the most radical thing that happened during the demonstrations in Ferguson was that people actually, you know, set stores on fire and, and burned them. And that, that is the thing that people immediately did in Baltimore. Like I said, these tactics are actually spreading and intensifying. Um, and that means that we will have opportunities in which we will meet each other when totally different things are possible. In our day-to-day -day lives, as anarchists, we try to demonstrate what a, a free world would look like. And you know, maybe we get our hands on a, a building like this, or maybe we get our hands on a, a piece of paper, and we share paper with people. Here, paper, you know. While, uh, while our enemies have airplanes and nuclear power plants. I think there will be moments ahead when, if we act quickly, in those moments we will be able to demonstrate much more radical forms of social change. But we will have to have our hands free and be ready to act. And in the meantime, the reason to start these conversations with people who are not in this room, with people who don't have any interest in the same bands that we do, who don't have the same cultural points of reference that we have, is that in a moment of crisis, in a moment of possibility, what people can imagine 
to be possible can change very quickly, but what people imagine to be desirable usually changes much more slowly. This is the reason to have the conversations about anarchy and freedom right now with everyone. Right? So, thank you for listening to us. Does anybody want to say anything about this? Is uh, this, uh, let's say, Russian? Yes. Yeah. Is it translated into Russian? There is a Russian translation, yeah. Um, if you want to get a copy of it, talk to me after. We're, we're still slowly putting everything up on the internet. One of the, the Russian comrades actually spent a long time uh, adjusting it to change it so it would be useful there. Nothing bad will happen if you speak. Yeah, well, well, I wanted to say that um, there are some things I do agree with right? um, about the point of um, having communication with the people and getting out of our ghettos and, and building up social movements and as well having an anarchism as an idea. At the same time, I unfortunately do not share this incredible enthusiasm towards the uprisings because mm -hmm. those are happening um, mostly without any political background, right? The people are more against their standing against something rather than standing for something. And as a result, you can get easily manipulated. Mm -hmm. A good example was Ukraine, right? Where the people were um, standing against the government. And actually, in general, in the post-Soviet Union countries, there is a tendency to stand against the government. But the question is what people are standing for. And in, in this context, the uprising is happening. People are rioting. It is important to work with those people, but at the same time, this is not the revolution, right? So we shouldn't expect that yeah, this is the day of the revolution and the streets will burn and the anarchists will burn. Yeah, um, I absolutely agree with you that uh, just one revolt or one uprising will not bring a substantial change. I mean, this is basically what we were talking about before, how, you know, oh, it was easy to overthrow a government, which is something that even in some countries like seems hard, you know, but it's not that hard, I guess. Um, not that I want to sound cocky or something. <laughs> um, but uh, the thing is that what we need to understand is that we are in a period that we are not like in a, in a linear time, you know, where every next revolt will be bigger, where every next moment of, of um, you know, rebellion will, will, will take us a step <coughs> further. Sometimes it will take us into a different direction. Um, it will, like, it would be a very big mistake for us in Slovenia, for instance, to think, okay, so unless, you know, there's another uprising of such magnitude happening, like, we're not participating in anything. We're just waiting for that moment to happen. Of course not. We have to, like, build connections. We have to, like, build uh, our different strategies, you know, create spaces of freedom, um, you know, change the relationships between us, all the things that we are already doing. The only thing is that what we realized when we actually found ourselves in that moment, and I think that, you know, the reality speaks for itself that those moments will come for everyone again and again and again, because the contradictions of the system are just such that it's impossible to go on and carry on the way uh, things are going, um, is that you know, are we prepared or are we not prepared, you know? And it's not about whether we think about, you know, is this the day, is this the, you know, the, the one victory that we're waiting for. It's not about that, it's just about, um, are we in that moment when the space opens up, are we going to take every advantage that we can possibly have, or we are preparing for that moment to push things forward, you know, even to, to create a situation where we don't know what the next thing, you know, is going to happen. if. You know, if, if the, the <coughs> governmental building gets burnt or if, if the fences fall or, or, you know, the military collapses. So that's, that's why basically we are doing this. Not to think that we have to prepare for D-Day because we don't know how that's going to look like. If it's come, I don't think it's going to come that way anyway, you know. But just to basically be ready for changes that are ahead of us. I wouldn't say that we're optimi optimistic about this, you know. I mean, the more the more of these conflicts happen, the, the more we can see the ugly side of them. The more we can see how dangerous they are, how much heartbreak is involved in them. Um, you know, I, I have friends who've been killed in, in these struggles. Um, 
we're not in favor of uprisings. We're in favor of participation, anarchist participation in uprisings. And we think that is going to be very, very important. In, in our town, we have a lot of little projects in the, in the town that I come from. 60,000 people, a little town. Not, not, not a big city like Prague, you know. Uh, but we, you know, we, have a, we send books to prisoners every week. And we have a, you know, we have a space where, uh, a free market where people just give, give things to each other, you know, outside of capitalism. We, we, we do all of these things. But the moments like Occupy and like uh, the protests that came out of Ferguson, which happened all around the United States, were the moments when we could meet a lot of people that we had never been in contact with before and who didn't think they were interested in what we were doing. I don't think the uprisings will do the work for us. I think we have to do the work. Speaking of that, because you mentioned Ukraine, you know, when we talked with our comrades there, you know, what was the biggest lesson that you've learned from them? They were saying, like, you know what, when Maidan started to happen, we were like, oh, this is a conservative thing, you know, it's a bourgeois thing, like, we don't care about you, like, there is no space for us there. And they just didn't go to the square, you know, most of them anyway. Whereas fascists, for instance, they were there, they were organizing with people who were not really politically aligned before or whatever. And, uh, you know, when the anarchists finally realized, hey, that's actually something that we should be a part of, you know, uh, and they came there, they had their anarchist library, and, which is great and very important. By the way, we have the anarchist library too. But it's not enough, you know, when other people are already on the barricades with the guns and those people are fascists. So this is the lesson that we all have to learn, that sometimes we ha it's not about, you know, saying, oh, this is not our struggle, this is, we, this is not our space, this is, you know, this, uh, this struggle is too problematic, so it's not a perfect anarchist rebellion because there aren't <laughs> such thing ever, I think. And what we need to do is like to understand those spaces as an open space in which we also can take part of, which we, in which we can radicalize and like you know just push it for, forward. So this is why I think it's very important that you know we are a part of them. And, and that being said, I'm sorry to, to be long here, but uh, that being said, of course there will be struggles where we won't, there won't be any space for us, you know. And, and this is also a problem that we talked before when, you know, you have Pegida, which is in a way organized, you know, the, in, in a lot of aspects, not all of them, the way we would organize in, in terms of tactics. But of course, the ideology is not such that we can go there and persuade people, hey, join us, you know, <laughs> that's obviously not working. Somebody else want to say something? Um, aren't uh, anarchists uh, participating in such a uprising that you, you've talked about in an ongoing danger of being co-opted, the, the, the fight being co-opted, isn't, isn't it better to keep the anarchist marketing clear? Hmm. Like, is, if it's clear so the the uh, the the anarchist idea isn't associated with all these co-opted forms. You mean something like this? Oh, uh, like uh, <laughs> as I as I understood you, uh, the, the uprisings you, you 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 were talking about the the common popular uprising. Right. They are not necessarily political. Right. But uh, yeah, but so. Maybe these alliances, if they are mm. they are dangerous for for the movement because they are the ri the, there's the risk of big comprom compromises and such. This this is the really hard thing, right? If you've been involved in one of these situations, you want to be in touch with with people who are you know who are in who are very different from you, but you don't want to uh, you don't want to pretend that you are not who you are, right? And you, in the anti-war movement in 2003 in the United States, we anarchists participated in anti-war protests that were organized by socialists that I think are terrible. Um, and usually what we did in those protests was that we were the militant people in the protests. You know, We made a movement more militant without really making it more radical. We took a lot of risks, and when we suffered for this, often they didn't help us, you know. But we, we kept our <laughs> politics to ourselves. The other extreme is that, you know, 
let me think of the other extreme. <laughs> okay, the other extreme is like, uh, you know, you, you have a group of insurrectionists, not to say that this has ever happened, and in the middle of the night you smash a bunch of windows, and you, you do this by yourselves, you know, so that you're not with people that you don't have political affinity with. Um, and eventually, you know, you're secret about it, but eventually you get caught and you're in some big court case and all of your resources are used up. And then there's a big social movement and you can't be there because, you know, right? Um, the, for, you know, this also happened in our town where, you know, by the time Occupy happened, we were like, where are the fucking insurrectionists? They were saying they wanted this, you know? Like, um... I, I wanted them there, too. I wanted them there being insurrectionists, saying, we're here to fight, but, you know, not for fucking, like, reforms and stuff. We're just here to be bad, you know? Like, that would have actually helped, right? It would have opened up a space where we would have had to have the debates that we needed to have. Um, I, I don't know if I'm speaking clearly enough to be understood. Um... So th this is the challenge, right? To, to, to meet people, but being honest about who we are, you know? And like, like you were saying, I think the, the reason when there is a, a situation that is unclear, the reason to be there is because maybe we can, we can find out who else is interested in what we're interested in. And it might be a lot of people. If we do it right, it might be a whole lot of people. And if we don't, and if we aren't there, certainly somebody else will be there. And what it will turn into will be a space where, for example, it's the government fighting fascists and there's no side that we can take. You know? If we end up in that situation, uh, you know, we will, we, will, we, will, we will end up in a world where when people imagine what it is to fight, they imagine either fighting for the government or for the nationalists. You know? In that situation, it will be very hard to, con to communicate with the people who might otherwise be interested in us. I guess we need strategies for that too, because this has already happened many times and it's probably going to happen again. And even if this happens, anarchists are still there and are not alone, you know, and need to anyway try to find ways to exist and to work with that. Yeah. But that's also maybe part of this, but then we'll do the discussion as well. I guess <laughs> it's not preventive, then it's seri then it's seriously just about problem solving straight away. I don't know what to call it. Yeah. Okay, we're out of time. <laughs> Does anybody want to say anything at I the think end? So. Please. Um, it's like to change everything is like it um, brings a lot of uncertainty mm -hmm. and I think you know like in this liquid modernity there's like a lot of uncertainty which we which we living through and like this I think like what people want is certainty is uh, to have like certain uh, salary s certain uh, things um, like needed for life mm -hmm. and when you when you like take um, certainty from people there's like what what rests is fear and fear produces like as i understand it like a lot of racism and all this stuff uh, so like i i don't uh, agree i i haven't read this mm -hmm. uh, this paper but i don't agree with that this is like the cure for a society problem for mm -hmm. problems of for uh, of people. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Other thing is that like my friends in Brazil, um, I know that like uh, on anarchist book fair in Sao Paulo, there was like um, distributed this brochure, mm -hmm. and my friends who like um, work with like people in favelas day by day, they really hated this text because they thought it's real lifestyleist poser kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Because it's um, focused on, on this like uh, this moment of revolt, but it uh, overlooks like these uh, moments of like continual um, 
work, like with people, for example, in favelas, which is like, it's evolution. It's not like revolution that you will come to favela and you will explain people that they should like do this and that and they will do it because it's this is also vanguard uh, approach to, yeah. to how to change society yeah. and because they they work like um, in long-term struggle like you mentioned this um, like fight for the uh, for the like pasta libre which is like free transportation mm -hmm. and um, it's not true that like the movement, the the political movement, the anarchists, they they only wanted to have like this uh, transport, um, not like the the price of the transportation, not uh, like rise up. It was it was other uh, other rhetorics. It was rhetoric like life without tourniquets because tourniquet is this symbolic stuff for the for the paying for transportation, but also like. In, uh, in more like uh, abstract sense, it's about like the um, possibility to uh, have like the medical care, the, mm -hmm. the education, and so on. So like you know like it was. The problem is that like this this um, long term struggle takes time and it's not yeah. like it's not focused in these small moments of like revolt mm -hmm. because also in Brazil there's there's a, a lot of there's complicated context of this revolt which was in 2013 and it's uh, going on now mm -hmm. because the people in 2013 like a lot of people came to the streets and it was like a lot of people of um, other standpoints uh, mm -hmm. of various like uh, political uh, beliefs so it was it, it was more like bursting out of, of some um, discontent with like the politics um, and for for this it was so like big and it wasn't like so um, that they want, not wanted to uh, yeah to pay more for the transportation so like you know it's this I yeah spoke a lot. no thanks for Thank that you. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that um, re moments of revolt, riots, you know, that, that's a space uh, in time and, and, and geography, you know, where we really feel a lot of adrenaline, it really kind of captures our imagination a lot. So I can very easily understand how, you know, if you just read through it or listen to us, like we, we really spoke a lot about it. But if you also listen to us in between those times, um, we also just spoke a lot about, you know, how we have our info shop, how we have, you know, um, a really free market, how we employ, you know, how we constantly, like, participate in student struggles, in Occupy, in, you know, like, just recently I came from Ljubljana where we organized this really huge uh, anti-racist football tournament, you know, an anti-fascist football tournament where we try a lot to organize with homeless people, with, with migrants and so on. So, you know, I, I would not say that um, the solution is, like, to just wait for that revolt, but getting prepared for that revolt, of course, includes all of those activities that we do every day, you know, to having our spaces, to creating, you know, to be part of the movement. But the question is how and which tactics do we use in those in those moments in between those revolts that are actually determining, you know, are we going to get into the, those peaks of uprisings um, more organized, more prepared, with better connections, or are we going to be, you know, um, closed in our own spaces, in our own ghettos, and I'm very critical towards my, my own squad here or whatever, you know, uh, you know, uh, or are we going to be, you know, very, um, very, you know, judgy about what kind of revolt is happening, or are we going to try to find our own space in it, you know, that kind of stuff. And this is, I think, what, we, what this text is actually trying to address. How can we, in every situation in life, find our own strength without addressing you know, the, the authority to grant us that strength, that power. I want to say a, a little bit more about this, and then, and then we'll be, be done, if that's okay. Um, I'll, I'll start with the second thing. The, the situation in the United States that is analogous or comparable to w w the favelas in Brazil are the, the ghettos that you know, black folks live in in the U.S. Um, the project, a project like this is, is not an attempt to like guide the people who are in revolt in the ghettos. You know, I, we don't have like a vanguardist approach. I think the most important thing really, the people there are going to fight, and they're going to fight probably harder than we have, have the uh, ability or courage to. You know? But the, the, the question is what happens then? 
We can imagine the United States government versus the most courageous people who live in the ghettos of the United States. Probably the military will win. The question is how to mobilize all of the people who are sitting on the fence in between those two places. And which side of the fence they get down on will determine what happens. You know, the reason to do a project like this is to try to address people who are, are not the most vulnerable, who are not the most uh, oppressed, you know, but the people who, who may choose either to, as you say, side with fear, with the government, with control, with the same things that oppress them, actually, or you know, to side with the unknown, with uncertainty. And, the, and so now to, to return to the first thing that you said, which I think is the most interesting and the most challenging. You know? I, I think you're right. I think you're right that, that uncertainty, the unknown, that we associate it with fear, and that, and that re really people will, will choose things that are, are terrible because they know them. You know. Over and over we go back to oppressive situations or abusive relationships because they're what we're familiar with. I don't think that this is necessarily a good thing. You know? And the, the problem really I think is that I, I would like to be able to promise everyone that all you have to do to get more stability is to become an anarchist and, and just be invested in non-oppressive relationships. That hasn't been a source of more stability in my life, you know? It may be that the people who can promise stability, well, it used to be that they could promise stability if you would be a law-abiding middle-class citizen. But that's disappearing also, you know? I think if there's any stability for, for any of us, it's probably on the other side of a revolutionary struggle. It's not going to be in this world. The, the thing that can sustain us is that we create these connections with each other, that we create you know, structures, networks of care, where we, where we are invested in each other, not in profit or something, where we, we take care of each other. But, but for me, a part of that taking care is that when people in Ferguson or in Baltimore are in the street putting themselves in danger, I have to be there putting myself in danger. You know? And, and that's, that's what brings me from a place of, of love and of care and of seeking stability also and, and, and seeking to care about, to take care of not only the people in my family but the people I don't know yet to around finally to having to talk about this question of uprisings and militant struggle. I think, I think we're out of time. Maybe we can have this conversation more. Um, thank you very much for being here with us, y'all. Thank you.